It's now time for the news review section where we delve deeper into one of the day's top stories, so stay tuned. Palestinian resistance movement Hamas says Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu is fully responsible for the failure to achieve a ceasefire deal in Gaza. In a statement, the group said Netanyahu is placing obstacles to reaching an agreement and is setting new conditions and demands. Hamas stressed the Israeli Prime Minister aims to thwart the mediator's efforts and prolong the war. It added that Netanyahu refuses to accept a permanent ceasefire and the complete withdrawal of the regime's forces from Gaza. Hamas said Netanyahu also sets new conditions regarding a prisoner exchange deal preventing the conclusion of an agreement. Once again, we affirm this commitment or the movement once again reaffirmed this commitment to the agreement reached in July, calling on the mediators to pressure Israel to implement the terms. Now to talk more on this, we are joined by Mr. Khaled Barakat, journalist and activist from Vancouver, and also Mr. Tony Gosling, historian and investigative journalist from Bristol. Gentlemen, thank you for being with us. Now, Mr. Barakat, beginning with you, your thoughts on the latest round of the negotiations uh, and how true do you think the comments are saying that Netanyahu is not looking for a ceasefire, a temporary one maybe, but not a permanent one. Now, what are his plans for pro the prolongation? Uh, some say the complete annihilation of Gazans, uh, an all-out war in the region involving Yvonne as well. Many speculations. Yes, uh, it's uh, very obvious for Palestinians uh, uh, that Netanyahu is trying to put uh, obstacles in front of reaching uh, a ceasefire. And Netanyahu is doing this not recently, but uh, since the beginning of the uh, war and the genocide, uh, Netanyahu government and his war council uh, are trying to roll on prolong this war to, uh, you know, um, uh, an endless uh, war against the Palestinian people. And Netanyahu is doing this with the full support of the United States. And the so-called mediators in this whole negotiation, they're really not, um, you know, pressuring or doing any kind of real political pressure. They're just like post mail people, you know. they. They take uh, messages and exchange messages, uh, uh, but in in in, uh, uh, in so many ways, the Palestinian people are uh, saying enough is enough, uh, not just to uh, the Zionist regime and U.S. policies, but also to the Arab regimes who are complicit in this war against the Palestinian people. I mean, part of the siege against the Palestinians in Gaza is carried by the Egyptian regime, and Egypt is trying to present itself as a mediator. Now, the Palestinian resistance is united in the position that Hamas have expressed. There is a unity uh, amongst Palestinians on this uh, position that we will not go back to uh, anything less than the July 2nd uh, agreement. The resistance have asked the Egyptians, the Qataris, and the United States to present a, uh, a proposal on July 2nd, and the Palestinian resistance accepted. But they don't want to go along with this, and the United States is trying to pressure the Palestinian people and the Palestinian resistance. And until now, as you can see, all the atrocities and war crimes that Israel is committing on a daily basis, it doesn't even get a condemnation from the United States because the Biden administration is fully backing the Netanyahu uh, war crimes. Now, in this round, it was a bit different because of the kind of the elephant in the room, which is Iran, Hezbollah, and Yemen response. And so, uh, you know, many thought that this is going to create a pressure on Israel and the United States to, uh, you know, um, achieve right. ceasefire. But obviously the Zionist regime doesn't care about the Israeli uh, captured in Gaza, doesn't care about international law. Uh, they could care less about what the Arab uh, regimes uh, yeah. are saying. And I think that we are entering 
a new stage uh, of confrontation uh, very soon. That's right. Mr. Gossing, sorry for the wait. Uh, in your opinion, what is the U.S.'s stance? Uh, we know that it's been fully uh, backing the Israeli regime in the decimation of Gaza, uh, but it seems that the permanent ceasefire um, and the ease of tensions in the region is what is now Washington maybe uh, to Washington's liking. That's what they're looking for. And also why? I heard that a number of Democrats uh, are even asking for an arms embargo on Israel, although it seems unlikely. Well, there's so much to say about this. Uh, I mean, I'm, I'm sorry to disagree with my colleague here, but there's nothing different about these negotiations. The, the negotiations for a ceasefire in Gaza are really a game of being played. Uh, that's the way I see it. The negotiations, uh, whenever it looks as if there may be some kind of compromise being made, uh, so uh, the Zionists are, are shifting the goalposts. So they don't want a settlement. We saw a very, very clear example of that uh, a couple of weeks ago with the assassination of Hamas's chief negotiator by Netanyahu and his pals just after a trip back uh, from the from the United States. Now. We in Britain, I can tell you, had a very similar sort of situation. It was called a peace process, uh, but there was no real interest in peace. This was in Northern Ireland, and it happened for around about 20 years, I'm afraid, from the mid-1970s right the way through to the mid-1990s. And it took really pretty much 25 years to get an actual real settlement, a real agreement. And the only way that happened was when the Irish Republican Army, the IRA, started blowing up. Um, big buildings in the city of London uh, after giving a warning. So very few people were killed, but it sent a financial message to the um, uh, the London elite, the establishment, that they had to finish the uh, war in Ireland, and they did. Uh, so uh, I, I think uh, unless there is really some uh, the, the financial screws are turned on Netanyahu, uh, we're going to get nothing out of this uh, ceasefire. It's also absurd to suggest that you're going to have a ceasefire uh, the, the, the Gazans and the Hamas are going to give up hostages uh, and then you're just going to carry on uh, killing again because of course they're not going to do that. There have to be uh, guarantees of a permanent ceasefire uh, and only after that guarantee for many months uh, had been adhered to by the Israelis uh, might, might some hostages be exchanged. So the whole thing from beginning to end is a total farce and I would say a game. Uh, so the, the Israelis are, are, are after doomsday, they really are. Uh, with nuclear weapons too, and they actually seem to want the only thing, the, the only positive thing I can see that's come out of this in the last few days is with the visit of the British Foreign Secretary, the new British Foreign Secretary, David Lammy. Very pleased to see that he's been snubbed by Netanyahu, refusing to meet him, because the British have, have withdrawn all their objections uh, to the arrest warrants being issued for the senior. Uh, uh, Israeli politicians um, and as a result of that Netanyahu has refused to meet uh, with David Lammy and I'm really glad to see that because the, what, what the um, uh, is, Israelis are counting on back in London is that their friends in the establishment, that is to say uh, the London media, they've got lots and lots of friends there, got, for example b uh, bits of news like this hardly get out here in Britain, the media are very reluctant to tell stories which are pro-Gaza, pro-Palestine uh, there's also, of course, King Charles, who initially, uh, in, in the King's speech last year, made it absolutely clear that he thought Hamas is a terrorist organisation, uh, and he's not said anything really in support of uh, the Gazans, uh, except for the usual. And, of course, the City of London, the financial elite, uh, they're also friends of the Israelis. They've been very supportive uh, of Israel over the years. So uh, it's amazing, really, that we've got a foreign secretary who seems to have uh, grown a pair. That's right. Uh Mr. Barakat, you talked about pressure earlier on. Uh, do you think the U.S. will be successful in persuading or maybe forcing Netanyahu to uh, finally agree to a deal? And another speculation I wanted to ask you as well, maybe the, the, the deal could uh, stop the anticipated retaliatory attack by Iran and the resistance axis in Lebanon, Yemen, Iraq and Syria uh, for the assassination of the Hamas political chief Ismail Haniye and also Hezbollah's top commander Fuad Shukr. Uh, because if that happens, uh, Netanyahu wouldn't stand a chance uh, and the U.S. has to get involved. Israel couldn't even handle Hamas uh, on its own. And this is not what I'm saying. I'm just putting forth what some are asking or saying. Yes, I think we need to look at the bigger picture. 
and the bigger picture is that Israel have failed in achieving any of its goals. The only thing that the Zionist regime is doing is committing war crimes and digging its own grave. Uh, I mean, speeding the process of its grave because Israel today is isolated internationally. The public opinion is very obvious, is shifting towards in favor of the Palestinian people and the resistance. Uh, the region is boiling because of Israeli war crimes and policies. Israel couldn't achieve, uh, you know, its goal in ending the Palestinian armed resistance. In fact, there is an escalation in the armed actions in the West Bank, even inside 1948 occupied land. And the situation is not helping the Zionist regime. In fact, it is uh, deepening the division within the Zionist colony. If you look at today, after over 10 months of this uh, war against the Palestinian people, is Israel uh, more stronger? Is Israel economy doing well? Uh, is Israel position in the region is uh, more uh, stronger internationally? Absolutely not. Israel has been exposed. And at the same time, we see that the Israeli economy is crumbling. The more this war continues, the more it shows that the Israeli army itself cannot uh, achieve any of their uh, goal, and Israeli army is actually having a very deep fatigue. I mean, we watch closely the situation in the Zionist regime, and we see how they are not organized, they are divided, and the Palestinian and the axis of resistance is actually united and have a strategy. And this is very important. Also, at the same time, as we see Israel committing all these crimes that it's happening, a more Israel is being isolated. The normalization process that Israel counted on, it's not happening. The uh, reactionary Arab regimes who are puppets for imperialism and for Western colonies, they are uh, cornered. The people of the region are more and more involved in the uh, anti-imperialist movement, anti-normalization movement. We have seen an unprecedented level of boycott to U.S. products and Western products, which means even the people uh, in the Arab world who are being oppressed by Arab regimes, they are actually boycotting Israeli and uh, U.S. and Western products. And I think that the price that the Palestinian people is paying is absolutely very high. Uh, however, we see that the Palestinian resistance is accumulating more strength and more and more people in the Shatat, in exile, especially in the refugee camps. More youth are participating now and wants to be involved in armed struggle. Right. And I think it's important to see the changes that is taking place, and also to see that Iran, Hezbollah, and Yemen are going to uh, definitely respond, and we will enter a new stage in the coming few days. That's right, Mr. Barakat. Mr. Gosling, uh, I thought I'd get some optimism from you. Not that it's wrong. Uh, it's just that I tend to think positive. So you said we won't see a ceasefire. Uh, so what will happen? An all-out war? Uh, that's what the trajectory looks like. Well, n not necessarily, because uh, what you're seeing at the moment is uh, actually fairly small actions uh, outside Gaza by the Israelis, these one-off assassinations. Uh, this is uh, an old trick from uh, the Crusades with the cult of the assassins, which they seem to have taken up, uh, which actually goes back a lot further in history. Uh, but I think, you know, I, also, I have to contradict what we've just heard. I don't think this is really about imperialism anymore. It's about much more. The attempt to create a third world war, uh, which is what this is all about. Uh, I mean, in a way, what's ha been happening in Ukraine is a bit of a sideshow compared to the uh, potential of uh, the, the, a, bit, a wider war in the Middle East, which would drag in the superpowers, the nuclear powers, etc. Uh, th this is uh, really about, I think, is now becoming about They've got to create this war. 
because out of that war, they will also bring uh, about a, a new global financial system, which they've already got planned out. That is to say, programmable digital currencies, uh, uh, which will allow you to only buy certain things. That's their plan. Uh, and the other thing is a kind of new age religion as well, because they want to blame this war uh, on the Bible. They want to blame it on the monotheistic religions, on the Abrahamic faiths. Uh, and that's their actual objective. So in a way, it's a sort of kind of super imperialism. That's what they're really, and of course, if you don't understand what their secret agenda behind all this is, it's not just about imperialism anymore. It's about far more than that, it seems to me. And they want to, they're quite prepared to take as many souls with them in this war uh, as necessary. In fact, uh, you could even call it a Luciferian plan. It's an attack on the whole idea, a war on God. Uh, and of course, God is gonna win. Uh, as we're told in all of our faiths, both the, uh, you know, the, uh, the Islamic faith uh, and in the Christian faith in the book of Revelation, uh, and of course in the Jewish faith in the book of Daniel, God wins this battle. So that's my positive sage. I mean, I think we're going to have a lot of trouble on the way there. That's but right. unless we understand that they are deliberately trying to provoke a major war in the Middle East right now, uh, then, uh, then I'm, we, don't, we, we, were, we stand less of a chance of actually winning that and if you really want to get into that go and have a look at Albert Pike he was around in the 1880s uh, and it was his plan not only to create the state of Israel but also to create this diabolical third world war uh, right. and, and I'm, I'm quite convinced that uh, the human beings are getting I mean for example Whitney Webb in the United States has really untangled masses about their their plans to replace the IMF and the World Bank She's taken that all apart. This is what they're planning to do after the war. Let's just make sure they don't get that war. There you have it, Mr. Tony Gosting, as always, a historian and investigative journalist from Bristol, and also Mr. Khaled Baraka, journalist and activist from Vancouver. Gentlemen, thank you very much. And with that, we come to the end of this news review section. Thank you, dear viewers, for being with us.